was an author in that literary agency. Uh, but the reason I'm so excited and why I love it is that it's a book about being a young woman in the city and it spoke to me uh, more than almost any book I've read last year. And it didn't just speak to me. All my editors uh, at Penguin loved this book because, of course, this book was felt absolutely universal. It felt like it was a book about them. And uh, this morning, Joanna wrote an email to me saying, Cheeky, do you happen to have your copy? I've lost my reading copy. And as it happens, my reading copy has been stolen by one of my editors in, in Penguin. It was, you know, it was on my desk, and then one editor picked it up, and then another editor picked it up, and then a publicist picked it up. And it was a kind of real favorite book of everyone at Penguin India. So it's a real thrill and privilege to be here, Joanna. Oh my god, it's such a privilege for me to be here. I'm so thrilled to be here today. <laughs> so I'm going to start with... Uh, with a slightly provocative question, which is, even though your book is called My Salinger Years, uh, I don't think it's about Salinger at all. You could have called it something completely different. Do you agree? I, you know, I don't know. Um, it's funny, this question has been asked, asked me before. Um, and for me, um, in conceiving of the book, um, the title, sometimes titles come to you um, before the work actually comes to you. And sometimes titles are very, very difficult and you can't figure out what the, what the right title is. I'm working on a story now and it's, that I keep changing the title. But with this book, I, I knew that it was going to be called My Salinger Year. And I, I knew that it wasn't going to be, you know, a biography of J.D. Salinger. That it, that the book, I, I knew from the start that the book wasn't going to be this kind of um, completely Salinger-focused book. It's not a Salinger tell-all where I, you know, reveal that he, you know, ate cornflakes for breakfast and that kind of thing. Um, but I, in my mind, um, for real, you know, honestly, authentically, in my mind, that year that I worked at this agency, I did think of it as my Salinger year. There's a way in which Salinger, um, even though he's not always at the forefront of the book, and the book is very much about my own experiences, there's a way in which um, he defined my life during that year and kind of shaped my life, but also the agency that I worked at, which if you've read the book, you know, is sort of New York's oldest and most storied agency. Salinger was kind of a god for this agency. It was almost as if the agency was a cult religion and Salinger was their god. So at the agency, our days and our work were, were defined by Salinger. Salinger was at the forefront of everyone's mind. You know, everything revolved around Salinger. It was all about Salinger. So in this Salinger year of your life, t tell us a bit about what you were like. You were, you were in your early 20s. You'd just finished college. Yeah, I was, um, when I started the job, I was 23. Um, I, had, I had finished college. Um, I went, it's worth noting that I went to a small, um, what's known in the States as a liberal arts college um, called Oberlin that was um, in the cornfields of Ohio. Um, so very far from New York where I'm from, a very rural place. But it's known for being a very, the reason I mention it, a very idealistic place where people go to Oberlin to sort of just truly to, to sort of learn and explore. It's very left wing, you know, in terms of its ideology. Um, and, um, and it's, it's kind of a, it's a wonderful, wonderful place, but in a way, it's a place that shields you from the real world. Like Oberlin is not interested in training you for some kind of profession. They're just interested in turning you into a thinker, no matter what um, you study there. If you're studying physics or chemistry, they're still interested in turning you into a thinker. And so I emerged from there um, I was already a very sheltered, if you, if you read the book, you'll see, I was already a very sheltered um, child. Um, my parents were World War II generation um, folks who, um, you know, didn't really watch TV. They didn't believe in eating processed foods. They were very um, skeptical of the sort of contemporary world and really tried to shelter me from a lot of the kind of bad stuff in the world. I didn't watch violent movies, I didn't play video games, I, and nothing. So I, I emerged from these two sort of coddled environments. My parents, this school where they were like, be whatever you want to be, um, spent a year in grad school in London and um, got back to the States 
and um, took this job and it was a bit of a wake up call um, being in New York, having no money, having a job where I was expected to um, actually do things um, and not just be told that I was, you know, sort of be asked what I thought about things. You know? Yeah, why don't you read us that, that segment? Okay. The, the one about the first day. Okay, so I'm go I'll read you a little, a little passage that will give you a little bit of an idea of what, um, what my life was like at this time. So basically, just to set this up, this is my first real day at work, um, and my boss, who is, uh, she, I say is because she, she still is alive and exists and is still kind of the same as she was <laughs> 20 years ago. Um, she was a very New York type. So if you're not from New York, you've probably seen movies about New York in which there is a character who kind of sweeps into a room, you know, and doesn't even acknowledge anyone else in that room. Um, perhaps she's wearing, as my boss did, an enormous mink coat that kind of swirls around her. She might be wearing enormous sunglasses that cover her entire face. Um, rendering her expressionless. Um, she might, like my boss, be holding a very long cigarette in her finger, um, and y you might, as with my boss, never see her without a cigarette attached to her finger, an ash kind of dripping, trailing her through the office or wherever she is. So m my boss arrives that morning, and, and that is what I, what I see. This lady sweeps in, doesn't say hello to me, doesn't say hello to anyone, goes into her, I sort of stood up, tried to say hello to her, and she just ignored me, and um, goes into her office and closes the door. When she came back out, she um, essentially handed me um, a bunch of cassette tapes. Um, presumably, people still remember cassette tapes. By the way, I just want to remind you that this was in the 90s. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this was in 1996. So um, even then, cassette tapes, not very common. Um, <laughs> she handed me um, cassette tapes and said, um, "Here's your here's your dictation. Here here's some here's your work. Here I, there, here are these letters. You know, type them up." And I had no idea what to do. Um, there was, I, I had had a computer, um, you know, since I was I don't know maybe twelve or or so, um, and. Um, on my desk was this enormous typewriter, um, a 30-year-old typewriter, um, an IBM Selectric. So if you've watched the television series Mad Men, it was basically the same typewriter that the people on Mad Men were using. But this was 1996. So it was this big and was so um, e enormous and complicated that I, and I'm not making this up, I couldn't figure out how to turn it on. Um, not because I was, you know, mentally uh, deficient, though maybe, I don't know. Um, but because it was so, there were so many buttons, because it was this, one of those machines manufactured in, say, like the late 60s, meant to look like a machine of the future. So it had, it had a, anyway, someone eventually showed me how to turn it on, and, and then I had to figure out what to do with these cassette tapes. I had no idea. It turned out that um, there was a thing called a dictaphone. Has anyone ever heard of a dictaphone? Anyone? I had no idea what this was. And again, another like machine of the future. It was this white plastic box um, and um, with, with no buttons on it, just like a, a white plastic box. It looked like something that you would see like, on Star Trek and, and like a voice would emerge from it like that would read your mind or something. But it, instead, it was um, an office tool. And eventually, someone came out and showed me that you stuck the cassette tape in and there were foot pedals. And I put on these huge headphones um, that now actually would be very cool. Um, and retro, um, and typed letters that she hadn't written. Okay, so that was a very long setup, and this is what happens after that. Um, so, wait, there's more setup, which is just that um, this all happened in the morning, and um, I, m my boss had not had an assistant for about three months, so she had this huge backlog of um, material to be typed, huge, all these letters, and it also meant that she had all of these writers who were waiting for signed contracts and advances and were really irritated because she had no one to, she wouldn't type a letter herself. So I had all these letters sort of finalizing contracts for these poor authors, now that I'm an author I feel so bad for them, who have been waiting for months for their finished contracts and advances. So anyway, so I spent the whole day typing and getting a contact high from her cigarette smoke and um, in the middle of the afternoon the kind of office manager um, 
comes over to me and um, this is what happens. Um, have you had lunch? He asked. I shook my head. He sighed. Somebody should have told you. You can go to lunch whenever you like. Your boss usually goes a little earlier. I go later, but I often bring my lunch, etc. cetera. Um, and um, I, I say to him, are you sure? You know, so it's like 3 o'clock and I haven't had lunch. I was like, are you sure? I asked. She, uh, she just took the letters I was typing. They can wait, the office manager said. Those tapes have been sitting around here for a month. Go get a sandwich. Out on Madison, I found myself gazing through the windows of a chain sandwich shop. It's wares too much for me because everything was too much for me. I had nothing. A few dollars my father had slipped me meant to last until my first paycheck, which I presumed would come at the end of the week. I didn't even have a bank account in New York yet. I had so little money, there seemed no point. My account in London was still open, and there was some cash in it, but I wasn't sure how much or how to access it in this pre-electronic era. My wallet held two credit cards, but these I reserved for emergencies, and it didn't occur to me that I might use them for anything but, that I might use them for something as unnecessary as lunch, no matter how hungry I was. I would, I decided, simply buy a cup of coffee and an apple, a couple of dollars at most. On the west side of Madison, I turned into a deli and inspected a vast pile of overripe bananas. What you like, called the white-clad man behind the sandwich counter, smiling. Turkey on a hard roll, I said, without really intending to, my heart beating with the recklessness of this gesture. Provolone, lettuce, tomato, and a little mayo, just a little. I think I thought they were going to like charge me for mayonnaise. Um, at the register, I handed over a 10 and was given two dollars and two quarters back, several dollars more than I'd expected to spend on so humble a sandwich. My pulse quickened with regret. Five dollars was lunch, 750, 750 was dinner. Back at my desk, I set down my sandwich and slipped off my coat. As I pulled out my chair to sit down, my boss appeared in the doorway to her office. Oh good, you're back, she said. Come in and have a seat. We have some things to talk about. Glancing sadly at my sandwich, still wrapped tightly in white butcher paper, I walked into her office and sat down in one of the straight back chairs that faced her desk. So, she said, settling in her own chair, we need to talk about Jerry. I nodded, though I had no idea who Jerry was. People are going to call and ask for his address his phone number. They're going to ask you to put them in touch with him, or me. She laughed at the ridiculousness of this. Reporters will call, students, graduate students, she rolled her eyes. They'll say they want to interview him or give him a prize or an honorary degree or who knows what. Producers will call about film rights. They'll try to get around you. They may be very persuasive, very manipulative, but you must never Behind her huge, heavy glasses, her eyes narrowed, and she leaned across the desk like a caricature of a gangster, her voice taking on a frightening edge. Never, never, never give out his address or phone number. Don't tell them anything. Don't answer their questions. Just get off the phone as quickly as possible. Do you understand? I nodded. Never, ever, ever are you to give out his address or phone number. I understand. I told her, though I wasn't sure I did, as I didn't know who Jerry was. This was 1996, and the first Jerry that came to mind was Seinfeld, <laughs> who presumably wasn't a client of the agency, though one never knew, I supposed. Okay, she said, sitting back in her chair. You understand. Now, go. I'm going to take a look at your correspondence. She gestured to the pile of letters I'd typed, neatly stacked on her desk. Seeing them, oddly, gave me a little rush of pride. They were so beautiful, that heavy yellow bond crowded with letters in inky black. As I left her office, smoothing my skirt, I happened to glance at the bookcases directly to the right of her doorway, on the wall opposite the side of my desk that held the typewriter. I'd been staring at that bookcase all day, staring at it without seeing it, so focused was I on my typing. The case held books in corresponding hues, mustard, maroon, turquoise, imprinted with bold black type. I'd seen these books countless times in my parents' bookcase and the English department closet at my high school. 
at every bookstore and library I'd ever visited, and of course in the hands of friends. I'd never read them myself, do it first purely to happenstance, then to conscious choice. Books so ubiquitous on the contemporary bookshelf, I barely noticed them. The Catcher in the Rye, Franny and Zoe, Nine Stories. Salinger, the agency represented J.D. Salinger. I'd reached my desk before it hit me. Oh, I thought, that Jerry. <laughs> okay. I was a little slow. Um, and Salinger was a kind of ghost presence in the office that year, wasn't he? He was. He really was. He sort of, he was kind of like this thrumming force that kind of vibrated beneath everything everyone did. Not just my boss, every agent. He kind of haunted the office, even though he was alive. And your job was to look at letters that people wrote to Salinger and monitor them and respond to them with a standard reply. But then you ended up sort of becoming quite emotionally involved with those letters. I did. I did. They were, they were such wonderful letters. Um, you know, I know even now, even today, I know it sounds so sort of naive and schoolgirlish, but they still, I, you know, I still have one in my possession and I still look at it every once in a while from my whole adult life, that letter, this one letter that I've, I've retained, um, I've had it pinned on the bulletin board um, above my desk. You know, so I wrote my whole, my, my first book is a novel called A Fortunate Age, and I wrote that whole novel with this letter pinned above my desk as a kind of talisman. Um, I, I suppose it, those letters, in a way, the, these, these people, these Salinger fans who were, writing, who were writing to him, just poured out their hearts to him. And they were these wonderful documents of human experience. Um, but they also, just pure and simple, were just moving. They were these stories of the pivotal moments in people's lives. Um, and there was such raw emotion in them. Um, but, but I think what they became for me, in a way, was testaments to the reality of literature, which sounds, I know that sounds ridiculous, but just the, sometimes you get so wrapped up in, um, when you're very young, in, in what you want fiction to be, and you have these kind of idea, lofty ideals about what fiction should be, and I certainly did. I was ridiculously pretentious, and I wanted to read difficult fictions, and you know, I thought nothing was important unless it was kind of dark and gritty and you know, horrible, and, um, and these letters really changed me because I saw the ways in which Salinger's work had profoundly affected um, this wide swath of the human population because the letters came from all over the world. There are many letters from India. And of course, you realize at the end of that year that um, your boss, your strange boss with her fur coat and her dark glasses, uh, her obsessiveness uh, and overprotectiveness of Salinger, uh, wasn't just part of her kind of general list of quirks, that this, this, that, you know, Salinger meant something much more to her. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yes, yes. Um, and you're so right, that's, you described it perfectly. I, okay. um, I, I really did think that my boss was, uh, at first, I thought that she was a kind of a bureaucrat who um, w the agency, you know, as is probably clear, was a little bit in the dark ages, right? You know, it, this was the late 90s, everything was computerized, and uh, the agency, which my boss was the president of, which she ran, um, she kind of, she was clinging to these practices from like the 1920s, basically. You know, there was this idea that, you know, um, the agency's heyday had been sort of the 20s through the 40s, and they had this kind of agency way of doing things. And I thought that this was all just ridiculous, that this was a quirk of my boss's, and that her protectiveness of Salinger was just an eccentricity, and that she was a little deranged. Um, but in fact, you know, um, Salinger did want to be protected that way. Like, uh, this was all sort of his, um, his request, like he wanted, he didn't want to see these fan letters. Um, he needed to not sort of have this outpouring of emotion enter his life. Um, and my boss had a personal relationship with Salinger. You know, she truly loved him. Um, and so she was kind of married to her job. 
and he was her real like only client and they were so close and so for her um protecting him was was kind of a mission it was kind of a personal mission and ultimately i i found that really moving and wonderful you know and today i have an agent and i'm very very close with her and i you know, obviously, I'm not J.D. Salinger, but I do sort of understand their relationship so much better. I'm just checking is, uh, in terms of time. Do we, we just have 30 minutes? Can someone help me? I'm, because I have loads of questions, but I could open up the... Are we good on time? We have four minutes. Um, does, I'm going to open it. I'm going to ask one quick question, and then we'll open it up to, like, maybe one question to the audience, there's obviously a hand here. Uh, I just want to ask one f final question to wrap this up, which is that uh, the, the portrait is, of course, the, your book is not just about Salinger and that year in the agency, it's about being a young woman, a 20, you know, in your 20s. And it reminded me in some ways of Le Le Lena Dunham's Girls, because it's sort of the same world. It's young women who come to New York, they're in their 20s, they live in Brooklyn. Uh, they don't have much money, but their parents are fairly wealthy, so they have a kind of weird comfort level knowing in the back of their heads that, you know, there's a, they're, they're not really down and out, but they feel down and out in every way, and they have terrible boyfriends. And what, do you, do you kind of look, when you revisited those years in this memoir, did you think, oh my God, how did I get through them? How did you feel? I did. I mean, I resisted writing this memoir. I had been asked to write this book multiple times. I'd, I'd written essays on answering Salinger's fan letter, um, a couple different essays, and one of those essays became a radio documentary for BBC Radio 4, and at each step of the way, I would get calls from agents and editors saying, hey, turn this into a book, and I kept saying, no, I don't want to do that. You know, first, partly because I, just because I think of myself as a fiction writer, I, I'm not super interested in writing about myself, but partly because I just didn't want to revisit that period. It was horrible. It was so confusing and awful to be in your early 20s. Um, but ultimately, I mean, I'm not a person who thinks that writing is therapy, like, that's repulsive to me, but ultimately, it really was great to revisit it. It was very hard. There were days when I would sit at my desk crying, um, just because it was so, so, so hard. Um, and but what, I feel what is good it about, <laughs> that I did What it. is it about being in your 20s? Why do girls, in particular, I think 20-something girls, why do they have it so hard? I think that, um... If, if particularly, I guess there's a whole sort of class thing here, but if you're sort of middle, upper middle class, you've lived in this kind of coddled um, universe. You know, your parents are kind of taking care of you, and um, more so than if you're a boy. And, um, and then you go to college, um, certainly in America. You go to college and everyone cares what you think, and they want to read your papers on George Bernard Shaw. And, you know, and, and then you enter the workforce, and no one cares. They don't care. <laughs> They don't care what you think, no matter what you're doing. If you're, you know, what, if you're an associate at a law firm, if you're a PA on a film, if you're whatever you're doing, if you're working in a research lab, they don't care. They don't want to hear what you have to say. You have to kind of work your way up a bit, you know? And it's, it's, so it's a sort of, I think it's a difficult realization. And for previous generations, it was not because there wasn't this illusion that people cared, you know, right? So for like those women, on Mad Men, you know, um, for like Peggy on Mad Men, when she takes a job as a secretary, she's stunned when people care what she has to say because she's just expecting that nobody cares, that she's just there to do the work and sort of be invisible. No. Questions before we close? It on? Oh, there. Do you think you were specifically picked for this job because they also sensed, your higher-ups, that um, you were this uh, a little sheltered person yourself and that would make you the perfect person to be very private about Salinger? I do. I think that, you know, as I said, my boss had been looking for an assistant for a very long time and um, that was definitely an element of it. I, I think it, 
um, again, I've mentioned that I'm a little bit slow on the uptake, and it was only in writing the book that I suddenly realized, wait, I wonder if she gave me this job in part because I'd never read Salinger. So, like, let's say, um, those of you who know New York know that it can be a very provincial place, actually, um, and there's a whole world of kind of New York prep schools, um, which is a very sort of small, closed society, and I'm, I'm actually sort of a little bit part of that world, but I wasn't so much a part of that world that... I was in the know. If I had been, you know, a kid who went to Dalton and or St. Anne's or whatever, I probably would have had friends whose parents worked in publishing, and I would have known that Salinger was a client, and I would have gone to the interview and been like, so, J.D. Salinger is one of my favorite writers, and I would love to work here because of that. And I just sort of went in and was like, hi, you know, I, I have a master's in English. I love Flaubert. You know, I, so uh, she knew that I wasn't going to... Um, you know, be sycophantic to Salinger if he called. I think that was part of it, that I, I appear to have no interest in Salinger, and that made me a better candidate for the job. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, so my parents are, as I said, these sort of World War II generation people, as was my boss. And I went to this interview dressed by my mother. And, like, I looked like something out of, you know, a 1950s... Um, romantic comedy, you know, I, and, and like my pencil skirt, and I was, or had like a fitted vest, and like a little jacket, my mother had picked this off, I was wearing a serge suit, and um, like red lipstick, and I think my, I felt familiar to my boss, she was like, you could have been me in 1958, you know, <laughs> whereas probably like presumably the other people going to the interview were wearing like mini skirts, because it was the 90s, before, and you know, chunky shoes, and I had court shoes on, so... You can, one last question. I, hello, this is uh, Dr. Neelam Tikka. Good afternoon. I just wanted to know whether your uh, uh, female character, does she represent uh, uh, society, uh, women's, this thing, empower, empowerment? Does she, uh, does she represent herself as an empowered woman uh, at any stage? And is it an authentic representation of women in that in those times? Um, do you mean the central the the character that is me, the the main no, no. character <laughs> in in this book, or do you mean another female character, or do you mean no, the no, boss? I'm meaning the female character in the book. So that there are there are two in a way. So you know we talked about Joanna, who is the young assistant, and her boss. And so, are you talking about the boss or yeah, Joanna as a 20-something? No, both. Both. Uh, like all, uh, all, all the female, all the female characters. characters. Yeah. Um, are they authentic representation of the condition of women in that time? I, well, I think they are. I mean, the book is true. It's not, it's not a novel. It's a memoir. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I wrote hundreds and hundreds of pages um, that were sort of everything that happened to me during that time. And I kind of carved this book out of it. So, um, so they are, to me, authentic. Um, I, I'll say one thing, though, that I think might be what you're getting at, which is that part of what this book is about was it, it is figuring out how to live your life as a woman who wants a somewhat um, different life than perhaps your mother had. You know, um, my mother wanted a career. Um, she grew up in the 30s and 40s. She became a housewife. She was not incre She was a brilliant woman who was not incredibly happy making, you know, cooking veal every night <laughs> and cleaning. And I knew that I didn't want that. Um, and I also knew that I didn't want the lives of a lot of the other mothers I saw who were working full time. This was you know the 80s when I was a kid, working full time and frantically trying, trying to take care of kids, and their lives seemed very stressful. So I. I was trying to figure that out. And I also knew that I wanted kind of the life of, this sounds cheesy, but the life of the artist. I knew I wanted to be a writer, and I didn't know how. I had no models for that. So a lot of what the book is is kind of me looking around and seeing who is here? What are my models? Who, am I going to be my boss who never had children, you know, never married, um, was kind of married to her work, um, and in a way sort of had to make this choice in the late 1950s and early 1960s when she was starting out in order, as an ambitious woman, she kind of had to throw herself 
into her work and sacrifice family. Um, do, I, do I want that? Do I want to wake up in 20 years and be my boss? I don't know. You know who do I want to be? What are my models? And I really didn't have so many. You know, do I want to be my best friend who has become obsessed with like her million dollar wedding to her um, extremely boring fiance who she possibly doesn't even love but who is going to be a good provider and you know take her to some like giant house in the Midwest like so I was trying to figure out who I wanted to be like what who what were those models for powerful women and not totally seeing them and realizing that I kind of had to forge my own path you know? thank you very much Joanna thank, thank you, you very much Thank you so much, Chiki. Thank you so much, Joanna, for an absolutely wonderful session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just a couple of announcements.